This afternoon, research reveals Galamse is contributing to Ghana recording 24,000 cancer cases annually. And also to come, fresh push for more districts to be created in at least 10 of Ghana's 16 regions. Also in this afternoon's bulletin, circuit court uh, ride hailing up bolts to pay 1.9 million cities in damages for failing to detect a rider's identity theft. We have details for you. You're welcome to News Central. Those are our top stories. I'm Kemeni Amano. And I am Maui Naik Beta. The bulletin starts right now. This afternoon, an Adenta Circuit Court has cautioned organizations processing personal data of citizens to live up to the high standards of care required by law to prevent use of identities for purposes other than that which the individuals have consented to. This caution was issued after the court found right hailing company Bo to have failed to prevent identity theft. A rider who requested a ride surprisingly found his face and name on the app as a respondent driver leading to him seeking legal redress. Let's walk you through exactly what the details of the suit are. And so uh, on your screens right now, we see uh, the case title, that's Justice Noah Dade versus Bold Ghana Limited and Bold Holdings OU. And the background is that Mr. Adade in August of 2022 ordered a bold ride on his phone and found himself photographed and details as being the driver to pick himself up. Now, when the ride arrived, it was his own employee, one Peter Walker, who was driving the vehicle. Now, Mr. Walker admitted to stealing the lecturer's identity and successfully registering himself as a driver on the Bolt app. Let's take you through the court's ruling. And what did the court say? That Bolt was required by Ghana's Data Protection Act to undertake a liveliness identity verification check. And the failure to undertake this check amounted to a breach of its duty of care. I'll walk you through the orders which were granted by the circuit court. And amongst many other things, he ordered both to pay 1.9 million cities as compensation and 20,000 cities to the lecturer as cost of his legal fees. Also, the Data Protection Commission is to ensure a forensic audit of both system and database to check the accuracy of the identity of all of its drivers up until March 2024. And then the Data Protection Commission is also to ensure all other ride-hailing platforms in Ghana undergo this particular exercise. Let's bring in uh, Nicholas Lennon Ananaje. He's a lawyer and a lecturer in law and technology. He's joined us uh, via Zoom this afternoon for a quick conversation. Many thanks, counsel. First, fair to say a major disturbing trend of data protection given some legal direction. What's your reading of this decision and possibly the way forward? Okay, thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, I think the decision by the Adenta Circuit Court is commendable and very progressive. If you ask me, in the landscape of the data protection regime we are in now, such decisions are long overdue because in other countries, you see such decisions being made, not even by the courts, but by the data protection commissions themselves. And so to have somebody go to court and mandate to secure a judgment, not just against any entity, but against such a well-known uh, public entity. I think it is progressive and it must be commended. The judge right. ought to be commended mm. for the decision. We know that the court did give some direction with regards to a forensic audit. Is that satisfactory or as a nation perhaps we need to start looking beyond just these uh, ride hailing apps because quite recently some have expressed concerns about receiving unsolicited messages from uh, political candidates among others. It comes down to the Data Protection Commission because like you rightly mentioned, the Data Protection Act 
provides against some of these uh, data breaches, particularly when it comes to unsolicited messages, the Electronic Transactions Act prescribes it. The Data Protection Act prevents and prescribes uh, direct marketing. But what you often see is, particularly in the case of government workers, every now and then you are getting a message soliciting or telling you you can come for a loan, you can come for insurance, you can come for this. And it all comes down to the Data Protection Commission. The reason being that, in my opinion, their enforcement powers ought to be enhanced because currently the Data Protection Commission's powers to issue sanctions is restricted. They have to rely on the court systems to be able to prosecute or individuals affected have to rely on the court systems to get compensation. Whereas in other places, take example, Nigeria, as recent as last month, Nigeria issued a fine totaling about $220 million against Meta because it found breaches of data on the use of its uh, data subjects. So I think that the Data Protection Commission has to be up and doing. They have to be proactive in terms of making sure that these entities, not just the private entities, but even government entities, such as controller and accountant general, agencies that are responsible for taking people's data are complying with the data protection principles in the Data Protection Act. But more importantly, I think we need an amendment to enhance the enforcement powers of the Data Protection Commission so that by itself, it does not only just back, but is capable of imposing sanctions that bite because currently the regime does not allow for the imposition of such hefty fines. You have to resort to the courts. So I think generally, by way of approach, it is long overdue. As a country, we are in a tech era, we are preaching digitalization, and incidental to that is the accumulation of data and the use of data. So we have to get the Data Protection Commission up and working as far as making sure companies and data processors comply with the data protection principles. For speaking to us, that's Nicholas Lennon and Anir J. Speaking to us this afternoon on the latest as we have it, we can bring you some other stories right now. Now, the Ghana Police Service has refuted allegations of preventing Democracy Hub from embarking on a planned protest scheduled for September 21st to 23rd. Uh, for them, they are up for engagement on a different location rather than the Revolution Square in front of the Jubilee House. Emphasize that the Ghana Police Service has not stopped Democracy Hub from embarking on a demonstration from 21st to 23rd September as is, being, as is going around. The only issue is that the police and the Democracy Hub disagree on the choice of location, that is the Revolution Square, for the planned protest. The service has duly communicated in a letter to the Democracy Hub that we are prepared to sit with them once again and agree on a location. And also, that the Ghana Police Service has put in place sufficient security measures to ensure that they get the opportunity to exercise their democratic right of protest. This is what we want to bring to the attention of the press and the general public, that the police service has not stopped the democracy hub we are still in engagement with them, which we have so done through a letter to them, and we are happy to meet them anytime as soon as a new location which will not endanger public defense, public order. Let's get you a bit more on the story. George Quainen is a reporter who's been covering uh, this beat. George, good afternoon to you. Tell us what else the police has been saying about uh, the plant demonstration. Hello, George. If you can hear us, I'm asking what else the police has been saying about the plant demonstration. It would appear we lost uh, George Quinn in over the, tele over the telephone, but uh, as you heard earlier, uh, the police appear to have a concern about, uh, you know, Democracy Hub uh, having is 
planned protest in front of the revolution, uh, rather at the revolution square. Uh, they say that they would engage with Democracy Hub further if they choose a different uh, destination for uh, this exercise. But let's find out from George what else the police has been saying about uh, the demonstration. George, talk to us. What else do we know uh, from the perspective of the police on the stalled demonstration? Thank you so much, Kemini. Kemini, on the 9th of July, the Democracy Hub actually gave a notice to the police service of the planned demonstration, which is the Occupied Junior B House and the Stop Galant Senior Quarters. And that the location they chose was the Revolution Square, that's in front of the Jubilee House. So the police actually did the assessment, and after the assessment, they found out that it would actually mar the public defense, public safety, and public health of the area, and also actually you know, prevent some uh, social services from going on. So it's a reason they, they actually went to court to get some interpretation. The court prohibited that very demonstration from taking place. And so for them, they are not prohibiting them entirely from taking the protest. They just want to just engage them. They are ready to engage them, surely. They come out with a letter to let them know that they should just change their location, and that is the problem. If they change their location, they'll provide them with all the necessary security for them to take, uh, to take their protest. But it's just maybe 25 is just around the corner, and it's just be for, for them to have that engagement. But they are still, the message they've given across is that they are willing to engage them. They should come and change the location, and then they'll provide them the necessary security that they want coming in. I see, George. Uh, did the police make uh, public the uh, uh, you know, alternatives for democracy have? No, no. What the director of public affairs, so that's ACP, Greens, and South, they don't have that, you know, uh, they're not the ones to give them an alternative, you know, route or anything. They have to come with a, a location themselves. The police is not. Uh, the, the, the one to give them an alternative uh, location. They should come up with the one, and if it's appropriate, and it doesn't really, uh, would you not even mar the, 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 the peace and everything about it, they will just go ahead. So they should come up with a new location. They are ready to, to support them with the security that they require. Uh, um, uh, Democracy Hub, regarding the police's position on uh, the uh, destination for uh, the protest. <laughs> Well, it appears George cannot hear us at the moment. Uh, we'll leave the conversation here. Thank you so much, George Quainin. Uh, he joined us from uh, the police headquarters where that news conference uh, just ended. We are your election command center. Rightly so. We are your election command center. I want to take you right now uh, to an event currently being undertaken by the National Disaster Management Organization, an election simulation exercise for eventual happenings on election day. My colleague Joseph Armstrong Goldalogba is there for us. We get the indication that this particular uh, simulation exercise has been uh, undertaken in other parts of the country, but we'll start here in the capital where Armstrong has been uh, participating and seeing exactly what the plan of NADMO is in the case of eventualities and then uh, a possible human rights crisis situation. Uh, Armstrong will join us shortly. Let's go to him right now for a bit of details. Armstrong, talk to us exactly what's been happening. What's the focus of this simulation exercise? I'm sorry, there's a, there's a difficulty in being able to hear you. I'm just hoping if you could reposition for us and then try to help us understand what the focus of this simulation exercise is. Right, uh, it does appear as a bit of a, a difficulty with... Here in Armstrong, clearly, but like I mentioned, this is an exercise that's been undertaken in different parts of the country. But let's hear from one of the NADMO officials who's been speaking to my colleague Joseph Armstrong Goodalope. Okay, so this is uh, election simulation exercise. 
uh, with our partners, our uh, interagency working group for emergencies and other first uh, uh, line respondents that we work with. Uh, elections normally doesn't concern not more that much, but election violence results into humanitarian crisis and that's where we come in. So we are only simulating a situation where there's an elections going on and as a result of the elections there is violence and all the humanitarian crisis issues come in, issues of displacement, issues of injured people, issues of people being shot at, in incidents of houses being burnt. How are we going to respond to this effectively so that we bring down to the barest minimum, the loss of lives and the loss to property. So this is what we are simulating for the, uh, the 2024 uh, elections, to get all the agencies ready, so that in the event that there is a situation, we will be able to contain the situation. Okay, so you sit in here, let's say for instance, a place in Abdukma Central, if there's violence there, do you signal and deploy, or deployment is not done by you? Well, that is not done by us. We are a coordinating agency, so we have the police, the ambulance service, the fire service, and we have their heads also represented at the EOC. So they will take their matching orders from their heads if they need to respond to something that is within their area of work. We'll leave it Any other thing you want to add? No, just to say that this is simulation. We only hope that uh, the 2024 elections will be conducted in a peaceful manner. But we have to always be ready as a country so that all response agencies will be ready working towards we having a peaceful elections. That's an ad more official. Let's try one more time, this time via Zoom, and engage Joseph Armstrong Gould along and get exactly what really is happening. Armstrong, an interagency collaborative work which has been undertaken. What can you report based off on the conversations and all that's been happening uh, so far? Well, we're currently here at the Nadmo Head uh, Protest, where you can see some soldiers. We have people from the police service, also Nadmo officials, immigration service personnel, and then also that of the fast service have all been gathered here in what they call a pre-section, a pre-election section, uh, to see how they'll be able to collate what is happening across the country, where we sit in the Nadmo Head Office, and they are able to communicate with people in the northern part of the country people from Central Region mm. and also some in the Ashanti Region, across the country, they are able to see all that is happening on the day of election. So exactly what is happening here now, so that in case they see any happenings, they can quickly deploy or alert the security agencies in charge of that, so they can quickly um, rush in there to solve the situation. Marina. And we know, obviously, the, the full disclosures of the plan will not be laid out in the open. But do we know all the agencies who are a part of this, this response group and who will be expecting to see come into action on Election Day? So currently, I can see soldiers. I can see that of the police service, police hierarchy. I can see people from the fast service personnel, that of the immigration and also prison officers and other sister uh, security agencies that have all been assembled here earlier and uh, they are currently monitoring all that is happening across the country so if the issue concerns the police the police hierarchy among the who um is told and then he informs their mother mother units and if it concerns the military where the military needs to move in the military among the group here is informed and he relays the information to the military hierarchy so basically that is what is happening here now and these um we are told it's not just taking place in accra here and there will be subsequent other uh, simulation exercises that will be taking place before the December 7th general elections. Marina. And just lastly, what is of specific interest for them based off on what you've seen from this simulation exercise? Marina, I'm told this on the very first time this uh, simulation exercise is taking place uh, ahead of a general election. It happens almost every year, but the public seems not to be aware of it. So the interest as it stands now is to be able to sit at the comforts of the not more headquarters here, where they are able to tell what is happening at a shaman, a spot, a hot spot in a shaman or a hot spot in a black central, so that if someone is carrying an offensive weapon which he's not supposed to be carrying, they can monitor it from where they sit in the comfort of their offices because they have cameras uh, scattered, uh, scattered across the country and also they have intelligence moving around. So they're able to pick information and inform the officers here, and then quickly they deploy to ensure that it does not get out of hand. Marina. 
Brother Armstrong, uh, many thanks for those details. That's my colleague Joseph Armstrong Goldalog. We're from the headquarters of the National Disaster Management, where an election simulation exercise is currently being undertaken. This is your election command center. And some news that's just coming through, the Affirmative Action Bill, which was passed, has been assented to by the President. It's a bill that's been hailed and praised largely by a lot of the rights groups in the country, that it will afford women the opportunity to be able to actively participate uh, in the country's politics. A long-standing bill which has been in Parliament for at least 20 years, finally passed by Parliament, now assented to by the President. Let's just try and walk you through this afternoon what the element of this bill is as we have it now as law. And amongst many other things, government is required to set progressive targets for achievement of gender equity. Also, the establishment of a gender equity committee to ensure and monitor compliance with the law. The government is required as well to ensure progressive gender balance in public office governance and decision making. Uh, a bit more. Affected positions will include ministerial positions, the Council of State, independent constitutional bodies, security agencies, the judiciary, parliament. Also, political parties are required to ensure progressive achievement of gender equity targets. And the Electoral Commission is to ensure that parties comply in respect of positions at national, regional and district levels as well in relation to the passage of this affirmative action. Now we can call it law because the president, as we get it, has assented to the affirmative action uh, bill. As the latest uh, coming through at this particular juncture. The last of it will be that private sector employers are required to ensure progressive achievement of gender equity targets. Uh, we know that a lot of the Women advocates have been making the argument strongly about the fact that a lot more needs to be done in, with respect to the targets as identified uh, in this law that has been assented to by, by the press. I'm sure there'll be a lot more conversations in relation to that, but we can now bring you Regional Hub. Twenty-four thousand. That's the number of cancer cases recorded annually, partly due to the activities of illegal mining and its harmful effects. The latest, according to the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research (CSIR), uh, forms a part of a basis in demanding the immediate suspension of illegal mining in all its form to safeguard lives and protect critical national installations. According to staff of the CSIR, over fifty. 50,000 hectares of forest is lost annually to the activities of illegal small-scale mining. I want to show you a bit more from uh, that revelation from this research body. Uh, we know that based on what the staff have shared on Galamse, some of the findings include uh, over 50,000 hectares of, of, of land or forest uh, that has been lost annually uh, for a while now, over 60% of water bodies. Uh, in mining areas suffer from contamination due to illegal mining activities and activities of Galamse operations contribute to environmental factors that lead to Ghana recording over 24,000 cancer cases annually. Now, mercury levels around 102 grams per litre reported in blood samples of residents living in Galamse affected areas. Public health crises also caused by uh, heavy metal poisoning and water pollution are straining Ghana's overburdened 
healthcare system. Just a bit more on what they're demanding uh, from the government and from the people of Ghana. Immediate suspension of all illegal small-scale mining activities in the country. Immediate recall of parliament to repeal the environmental protection mining in forest uh, reserves regulation 2022 LI 2462 and restoration of degraded lands and water bodies. Away from that, the Pharmacy Technicians Association of Ghana has revealed a growing trend of patients' resistance to medications as a result of polluted water by illegal mining activities. According to PTAG, uh, the, the consequences is dire and very devastating, hence the need for government to heed the call uh, from well-meaning Ghanaians to check the canker. We'll now head to the central region and speak to our correspondent, Thomas Khan, uh, for a bit more on this story. Thomas, uh, we've got to a stage where patients are building resistance to drugs due to galamsey. That's what you report. But tell us how, you know, PTAC thinks the situation is dire. Well, according to PTAC, uh, the situation is really dire uh, because already uh, because of uh, the galamsey issues and other packets, uh, the, even the existing medications that people do know, for instance, uh, uh, antibiotics and other uh, normal medications that in the past people have been using to treat some ailments, have been uh, proven to uh, give some kind of uh, reaction, that people are proving some kind of, uh, uh, you know, and they are not, they are not really uh, given the kind of um, medications that they are supposed to be getting so that they, they can, uh, that can uh, give the treatment to their bodies. And this is due to the hard uh, metals that get into the water bodies and other uh, environmental spaces due to this uh, galamse activities. Mm. And they are claiming that uh, this cyanide, cyanide and then other hard chemicals are really uh, destroying uh, the water bodies, uh, which is also affecting uh, some of the, um, uh, the, the even the food and the crops that are even I see. Uh, on the market that uh, uh, people are consuming. Mm, very well, Thomas. We know there have uh, been calls as well for banning of fake medications. But before you even tell us about that, talk to us uh, about you know how widespread PTAC says the situation is. Well, they say it is widespread. And that is why they have also added their voices to or the numerous calls uh, on government to uh, try and ban all, all forms of uh, mining in the country. And they are claiming that uh, this is not just uh, one uh, particular place uh, of the mining, uh, mining places where illegal activities are going, but uh, all over. And they think that uh, when it comes to diseases, uh, it doesn't know uh, who or who, who is involved. So it is very important that government, as soon as possible, uh, take steps uh, to ban all forms of mining uh, to, to, to check this menace. Mm. Very well, let's take a listen to the president of Peter. We've seen um, a lot of d serious diseases that are coming, that are emerging, that are coming up. And it is all as a result of the fact that we have allowed our waters to be polluted by this galamse menace. And to tell you what, the medications that these are supposed to be given to patients who are sick, these galamse menace, because of it, patients are becoming resistant to it. And this is serious. Can you imagine you are sick and then doctor prescribe a medication for it because of somebody's recklessness in doing galamse in our water bodies? You have become resistant and then the medicines that are given is not able to treat you. Can you imagine the cost of healthcare in Ghana, all of them going up because of all. Mm. Uh, Thomas, we, we also know that you spoke to a clinician who doubles as, uh, you know, one of the traditional authorities there. What did she tell you? Hey, about uh, this growing trend. And then she is more worried that uh, because of this growing trend, a lot of the quacks who roam around in the communities uh, posing as uh, pharmacy technicians or uh, drug uh, administrators 
uh, selling fake medications to people. And this is one thing that she, uh, she thinks that uh, government needs to also do more to strengthen authorities who, are, uh, who have the mandate to check some of these uh, quack people who roam in, into the communities to sell fake drugs uh, to people, especially uh, mm. people who do I not see. have knowledge about some of these uh, um, ailments. And they go about very well. Uh, uh, Thomas, how about we take a listen to uh, the clinician now? All of us will educate the community to be more mindful about the people going from door to door and selling fake medication. In fact, I, it upset me sometimes. You have people selling herbal medicine. I don't say herbal medicine is bad, it's not. You know, because when we were young, our grandparents and all that, that's what they used. But you have the herbal medicine, you have a fake uh, medicine. If somebody is sick, the person needs help. They don't need you to deceive them, to take the peswa or the one city that they have from them and tell them that they are going to. Uh, be well. You know that it's not true. So, and I'm talking to the community too. If you don't feel well, go to your clinic, seek help. Well, Thomas, we'll leave you here. Thank you so much for talking to us. All right. From the central region, I will take you to the Ashanti region, where Galam says at the Akrokre in the Adansi North District of the region say, though the mining activity is not licensed, it does not cause destruction to water bodies in the forest. They claim lack of job opportunities for the youth in the area is a reason for the thriving mining activities there. The youth, however, refuted allegations that the queen mother of the area is involved in the Galamsi activities. There is no river in Akokere that flows that the Galamse activities has destroyed. Never. We have never destroyed any forest in Akokere. Yes. Now let me tell you, where we are digging or where we are finding our livelihood is an old site that our forefathers were mining. Yes. It's not that we started it. It is an old site that is there. And we the youth, we saw that we are very hungry. And then we have to find a solution to our problem. And that's the reason why we took the, the bull by the horn and went there to mine. When it is breaking day, come to the site and see the old men and old women that come there to get what they will feed for the following week. Uh, Do we call this as something bad? No. Oh, no. Me and Evan, I'm asking you. We have not destroyed anything. We are citizens of Akokere. We have miners in this town. Nananum invited this so-called miners to her palace, so that we will negotiate with them so that the youth of this country or uh, this village will have something to eat. Uh, youth in the Akokure Township, Ibrahim Abubakar is on this beat for us, has joined us via Zoom. Ibrahim, how different is this area from the others where we've told the stories about the impact of such mining activities? Well, so when you go to Akokere, uh, the way they do the Agalamse, like you said, is quite different from um, what we have been reporting on. Mm. So they dig a hole and it goes down. So they mine um, in there. Um, so you, you wouldn't see them destroying large tracts of farms or, or lands or even water bodies. So... They do, DS is like kind of underground mining. mining. So they go there, they bring in all the stones, they wash it there and extract the gold that they are searching for. So they are saying that uh, most of them said um, it is not, 
intentional that they have to do this illegal activity, but because there are no jobs in the area. So even though there has been sustained calls to place a ban on even small scale, all form of small scale mining, and they believe that it will not work until government um, bring out strategy to create more jobs for their youth. So they are more concerned about um, the destruction of water bodies and also farmlands. And they believe that if even all the illegal miners will do it the way they are doing, then at least we will reduce this form of um, reduction, uh, this form of destruction across the country. And, and what's forced them into coming out with this, with this news conference? Has uh, any of the, of the regional security tax force visited the area? We know that the member of parliament for the area had spoken uh, earlier this week about the activities of illegal mining within his constituency. Is this what has prompted them to come forward with this explanation? Well, so two things. One, because of the sustained force on... on, on uh, the need to place ban on all forms of small scale mining activities, which they show when implemented will deprive um, about 60% of them from their main source of livelihood. And two, also, they were fighting for their traditional authorities. They were saying there has been a series of allegations against their queen mother that she is directly against uh, uh, involved in illegal mining, and they wanted to clear that. In fact, they said she was even trying to speak to two mining companies that are currently operating within the enclave just so they will employ the youth there and, 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 and bring or minimize the activities of illegal mining there. But they have not done that. So that is it. One, just so um, there will be job opportunities for them in case government goes ahead and place a ban on these mining activities they will still find something and also to declare their um, queen mother on that allegation. Rather than Ibrahim, uh, many thanks for those details and explanations. Ibrahim Abubakar is my colleague in the Ashanti region. He visited the Akokre township and mentioning of the traditional authorities in the area, the president of the National House of Chiefs, or Jiahoya Ojibi, has been speaking in relation to the activities of illegal mining and made the argument strongly that it should not be banned. Here's what he's been saying. You all know I hate Galamse. I fight against it. It, however, does not mean that you shouldn't mine. We own the gold. There are good ways of mining. If you make an application, you'll be taught how to correctly mine. Those calling for state of emergency, a ban on mining, are not considering its impact. It will have dire consequences. People can lose their jobs. Do you know how much money we'll lose? We rather need to find effective ways of mining. that's the president of the National House of Chiefs, Ojiya Hoho Iyao Jibi. He will take us on to our very first break here on New Central. When we return, a bit more between that impasse uh, involving the NDC and the Electoral Commission, former minority leader Harun Idris, who has been speaking in that regard, we'll hear exactly what he's been saying. Stay. Welcome back to Central. Uh, you're live here on TV3. Now, residents of Boma in the Tano North constituency are venting their anger over the cancellation of the Cocoa Roads projects that uh, had roads in the constituency captured. Uh, there is extreme anger, especially in the hometown of the spokesperson of the Vice President, Dr. Gideon Boakon, whom they believe is hoodwinking them uh, to vote for him as parliamentary, uh, you know, parliamentary candidate and the NPP. Western 
region, Western North Ahafo. Bono East, Bono and a host of other regions have had their roads halted for audits at the beginning of the MPP administration. In Boma of the Tano North constituency, the situation is not different. Residents of the hometown of the spokesperson of Dr. Baumia, Dr. Gideon Boako, are angry. I'm in full. I'm in full. The papa. Confusion broke when a supposed relative of the MPP's parliamentary candidate, Dr. Gideon Boako, tried convincing them that the NDC. This afternoon, the National Disaster Management Organization, in partnership with all relevant stakeholders in the northern region, is undertaking a simulation exercise that has a bearing on humanitarian consequences in the build-up to the 2024 general elections. As flashpoints continue to emerge from time to time, the state emergency security apparatus uh, has often been activated at all times to be able to deal with any unfortunate incidents uh, that could escalate into violence violence and a possible national crisis. Ghana will go to the polls to, to elect the next president and parliamentarians on 7th December. For more on this, we are joined by Christopher Amwako, he's a Savannah region correspondent. Chris, talk to us about this simulation exercise. Uh, you know, why, why the northern area? What is Nadmo saying about it? Yes, yeah, so uh, Kemini, basically, this is a national exercise that is supposed to take uh, place across all the 16 regions. But uh, here in the northern region, it is to evaluate and also uh, ensure the preparedness of the various stakeholders ahead of the 2024 uh, December 7th election. And so uh, the military, the police, EC, and other relevant stakeholders were brought together so that they can assess their preparedness ahead of the uh, elections. They have uh, actually been talking about the fact that this election is crucial and for that matter everybody needs to come on board to ensure that we get a peaceful election going into the de uh, December. And so uh, the regional NATMO uh, director has been explaining uh, to the media that why this exercise and uh, what the exercise seeks to achieve. Let's take a listen to what he's been saying. Hmm. As part of um, preparation towards the national elections, we are trying to put together, we try to put together a contingency plan, which is supposed to address any hiccups, any issues that may come out, out of the elections. And in doing that, we brought together all the stakeholders to one table. That will be part of um, the elections, including the electoral commission, police, all the security agencies, and then the CSOs that will support whenever there is an outcome that people may not like and they, it may end up in violent situations. So in doing that, we brought together all the national stakeholders at the national table and we decided to put together a simulation, a, a, a contingency plan. After putting together the contingency plan, we need to test the plan to see. Indeed, Chris, I'm afraid we'll have to end our conversation here. But pleasure talking to you. Christopher Mwako is our Savannah region uh, correspondent. We've been talking to him uh, about that simulation exercise up north organized by NATMO and other stakeholders and then regional hub.
And now that the news, former minority leader Harun Idris has reiterated the NDC's call for an independent forensic audit of the voter register. The largest opposition party, uh, civil society groups and sympathizers poured onto the streets to pressure the EC to subject the 2024 voter register to an audit after persuasion failed. In a soon-to-air interview on hot issues, the Tamale South MP challenged the Electoral Commission to allow the audit if they have nothing to hide. My own constituency, the Tamale South constituency, we have had some mystery Mm. of illegal voter transfer to Pusiga constituency. How did that happen? Who supervised it? Who authorized it? In liquid who? With officials of the electoral uh, the, the EC has admitted so to that one. It is not enough to admit. I hope that you are watching CNN today. Just go to the US, either in Alaska or in Arizona today. There is correction of about 100,000 votes on an electoral roll in America. So what is this holier than thou feeling or persona that the chairperson of the Electoral Commission seem to be manifesting or want to manifest? My strongest view, an Electoral Commission is only relevant to the extent that it serves the Ghanaian electorate and political parties well. You are irrelevant if you cannot serve the citizens well. Today, we all cherish our peace. We want to preserve our peace. We want to preserve the integrity of the election, safeguard our democracy. We are celebrating 30 years of it. We could have done better. We do not want acts or conduct, omissions or commissions that will soil the outcome of the December 7th presidential and uh, parliamentary elections that can spell doom for the peace and tranquility of the Ghana we love and the Ghana we so cherish. So don't take these things uh, lightly, lightly and just say that the NDC is not the NDC. It's civil society, the National Democratic uh, Congress, observers of the political land. The Tamale South MP Harun Idru. So the full interview airs at 2 p.m. on Sunday with my colleague Kemeni Amana. Going for another short break, we return with Ghana Remembers and By the Numbers. Well, today on Ghana Remembers, we put the spotlight on the thorny issue of whether Ghana's electoral rule is credible or not. The last few weeks has seen the opposition NDC mount a strong case for an independent forensic audit of the voters' register. Watchers of the political space can't help but notice the deafening silence of the governing NPP. What is ironic is in the past when the NPP expressed concerns regarding the register, the NDC emphasized the independence of the EC to decide how to deal with the matter. We'll take you back on memory lane. So far, we have only completed less than 10% of the search on the register. Less than 10% of the search. Uh, it's work that is ongoing. Uh, and we will soon uh, begin work on the Ivorian register to check the western border as well. And then we will look at the data as well. is therefore incontrovertible that Ghana's voters register has been compromised. It is not a document we can rely on for free, fair and transparent elections in Ghana. The electoral list, um, I normally don't want to comment on it because it's not my job. We have an independent electoral commission and the electoral commissioner Commissioners have security of office. Once they are elected, the president cannot remove them. I'm not supposed to interfere in the work of the Electoral Commission. And so, really, asking me this question, I don't know what to say. If the Electoral Commissioner was sitting here, you could ask her, what are you going to do about the electoral list? But I have no right to interfere in that electoral year. Ghana has an Electoral Commissioner that is independent and does not, you know, uh, consult the president to do anything. Well, we have to look at whether they have a case, and that's why they are supposed to present their view. Uh, but they've not only presented their view, they've been holding demonstrations and so on and so forth. So it's for the Electoral Commission to decide what's really to do. 
Now, the question remains, why do parties in power emphasize the independence of the EC yet demand accountability which downplays uh, this independence when in opposition, your guess is as good as mine. That's it for Ghana Remembers. You know, and more interesting about that picture is that today there are the two candidates. Absolutely. Top runners in the top election. Top runners yeah. and the positions now differ. Yeah. Where one is making the argument that, look, allow for a forensic audit. Uh, we're, we're learning the governing new patriotic party is addressing a news conference a lot later today. Oh, no, absolutely, at one o'clock. Yes. Uh, I think that should, you know, start any time from now. From now, will be top of the agenda, the, the voters register. Already we've seen its national organizers say they will not allow mm -hmm. the EC to conduct that yeah. forensic audit and that they may hit, head to the Supreme Court. So it's, it's an interesting dynamic as to what the position is when you're in power and what it is as well when you're outside of it. But let's scan right now as we try and make our way out of the studio. Kindly pick up your smartphone and scan that QR code for us and be a part of the 3 News WhatsApp channel. It is where you'll find all the details like we've been bringing you, 24,000 uh, Galamse induced cancer cases and the likes. All things news related from our news cards to videos and explainers, you name it, as well as links to 3news.com where you find the stories up to the minute speed uh, when they come through as always and so do well to be a part of it now speaking of 3news.com let's take a look at some of the stories you can see there uh, right now we brought you that 24,000 galamse induced cancer cases recorded annually you know that very interesting story about bolts which has empowered me as a rider and then you know a bit more on ghana's elections at the VRA staff stage in a protest. So go there now and read all the stories that you missed here on New Central. A bulletin for you. I am Mawina Egbeta. And I am Kemeni Amano. We'll see you same time tomorrow. Bye-bye.